Hello. Hello, can you hear me? We good, David? Test, test volume higher. We're getting some, some higher recommendations. Test, 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 testing just to check. Test, test, this one sounds, sounds loud as well. Great, um, if, if there's anyone who has uh, reduced mobility needs, there are two spaces up here at the front. It's not the easiest to get through, but those spaces exist if you need them. So welcome everyone. Um, bonsoir, bienvenidos a todos. Um, my name is Luke Langel and I work here at Libre John and Quarterly. It's a tremendous honor to get to introduce Desmond Cole tonight for the launch of In the Skin We're In, in conversation with Emily Nicholas. Libri John and Quarterly recognizes that our events and bookstores are located on the unceded territory of the Ganyagahaga. Many of us refer to Montreal as our home, but it is named Jojagre. We're grateful that creating and sharing stories has been a part of this land for thousands of years, and we urge you to seek out a story that is different from your own. We'll begin with a reading tonight by Desmond um, from The Skin We're In, A Year of Black Resistance and Power. And we have signed copies available for purchase at 15% discount because Desmond so graciously agreed to participate as our author shelf this month. So he, he also picked five books, which you can check out at our other store. They're all amazing picks, if you ask me. Um, and by purchasing the book from us, you help us offer other amazing events like this and, and support authors. Um, and as an independent bookstore, we're so appreciative. After the reading, Emily Nicola will then join Desmond on stage. Um, and they'll be in conversation. This will be followed by a quick break uh, to reorganize the space and then a signing. Um, uh, Desmond, he's going to be signing first at our other location, diagonally across the street, where we have an overflow space for those of us who weren't able to get in tonight. He'll sign there first, and then he'll come back here and sign for you folks. So after it's done, we'll just hang around a bit, get to know each other, and then, uh, yeah, he'll, he'll come back. Um, so um, Emily Nicola is an anthropologist, Lit of War columnist, and active in many movements that unite citizens against racism and social exclusion. Her research is focuses on the role of a shared language in the connections between Quebec and Haiti. Desmond Cole is an award-winning journalist, author, radio host, podcaster, activist, and activist in Toronto. His writing has appeared in the Toronto Star, Toronto Life, The Walrus, Now Magazine, Ethnic Isle, Torontoist, BuzzFeed, and The Ottawa Citizen. He was the subject of a full-length doc CBC documentary back in 2017, which was also named The Skin We're In. Um, and this past Sunday marked the end of five years of Desmond, Desmond's, Desmond Cole's eponymously named uh, weekly radio show on News, 10, News Talk 1010 in Toronto. Um, yeah, five years, wow. Um, since its release in, on January 27th of last month, the Skin We're In has jumped to the top of the bestseller list all across Canada. The book is a brilliant chronicle of how white supremacy permeates all aspects of Canadian society. Cole directly confronts the fact that racism and anti-black racism thrives in housing, media, education, publishing, border services, policing, our pol prison systems, in our refugee systems, across all levels of government and beyond. In brilliant journalistic fashion, the book acts as both an expose and scathing critique. Sentences are crafted with such care, and Cole is brilliant with the way he uses narrative to create such an accessible book. Although Cole is chronicling a year of pain and tragedy of the lives of black people in Canada, the book is also very much about building community, excuse me, finding solidarity, and organizing resistance. As the inimitable David Cherry Andy puts it, Desmond Cole is imagining futures in bravely intimate terms. He is an urgent and essential voice from a generation that will be heard. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Emily Nicholas and Desmond Cole.
this is so beautiful what I can see right now. Um, it might not be so comfortable for everybody standing at the back, but it looks wonderful. And I thank so many, everybody uh, for being here. Thank you for coming. Um, it's also just an incredible honor to share the stage with my friend whose work and whose experiences are in here also. I've shared uh, these experiences and these stories with so many of my black family across this country. And so to be able to get to do this this evening is a tremendous privilege for me. So thank you, Emily, for being here. Um, yes, indeed. I'm going to read you um, some ep excerpts from the October chapter of this book. Every chapter of this book represents one month of the year 2017. Um, and um, in this chapter, I'm talking about immigration primarily, and I'm talking about um, the history, um, you know, that has made travel and arrival and remaining here so difficult for black people. Um, of course, we know about all of the Haitian asylum seekers who were coming here uh, during 2017. And this chapter kind of chronicles some of that, but also travels back in time to look at things like the domestic workers scheme through which uh, um, Caribbean women black women were coming here alone because the rules made them come here by themselves and had strict regulations about how they could come to Canada to work in white people's homes so that they could go out and further their own lives while we labored. Um, and, then we'll, and then we'll have our discussion after that. In October of 2017, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police detained 1,755 people who had entered Quebec from New York State without permission from the Canadian government. In July, arrivals of this kind had increased from about 600 a month to nearly 3,000. In August, the number nearly doubled again to over 5,500 asylum claimants. Many of these travelers were Haitian asylum seekers who had been living in the United States, but feared they would soon lose their status there. Overall in 2017, 8,286 Haitians applied for asylum in Canada. They represented 16% of all applications made that year. At one point, the government deployed about 100 soldiers to set up camps at the Quebec-New York border and to assist the RCMP and border agents with security screening of the hundreds arriving each day. Marjorie Villefranche of Maison d'Haïti, a community service for Haitian immigrants, told media, quote, there is an enormous amount of false information circulating saying that it is easy to come to Canada. They are hearing that Canada doesn't deport people. The United States had been offering Haitians temporary status since 2010, when Haiti experienced a catastrophic earthquake that killed 250,000 and forced thousands to claim asylum in the United States. In its first months in office in 2017, the new Republican administration had signaled its intention not to extend these protections. The arrival in 2017 of these Haitian and other black asylum seekers to Canada on foot, often with children, could become a black origin story for the future. One day we might brag about how we welcomed so many black folks fleeing the United States and the administration of its 45th president. But in October 2017, the detention Processing and eventual rejection of so many Haitians showed that Canada didn't want black asylum seekers, no matter what threats they might have faced south of the border. Seven years on from the earthquake, Haiti was still dealing with housing shortages and a cholera outbreak. 
Despite Canada's historic relationship with Haiti and our significant interventions in that country's governance, we tried to keep Haitians at arm's length in Canada and to make their stay here temporary. In November, we learned that of the 6,304 citizens of Haiti who had sought asylum in Canada between February and October 2017, only 298 had had their claims finalized, and of those, only 29, or 10%, had been accepted. Immigration Refugees and Citizenship Minister Ahmed Hussein, himself a refugee from Somalia, reminded us that asylum claims were only for people whom the government deemed in genuine need of protection. It's not for everyone, he said. Canada reinstated deportations to Haiti in December of 2014, when Haiti was in the middle of a cholera outbreak caused by UN peacekeepers. In August of 2016, the federal government stopped allowing Haitians who had arrived since 2004 the opportunity to apply for permanent residency or to stay in Canada under, or, or sorry, under, or to stay in Canada under humanitarian grounds. So when the United States confirmed in late 2017 that Haitians would indeed lose their protected status there by 2019, it would have been fair to say that the Americans were simply following Canada's lead. Lawyers continue to fight the administration in court, and the deadline for Haitians to stay in America has been extended until January of 2020. In November 2017, Canada sent black government officials to the United States to discourage black migrants from Haiti and African nations from walking across the, Canada, the Canadian border to seek asylum. One of the envoys, Haitian-born member of parliament, Emmanuel Dubourg, described the effort by saying, quote, the main reason is to tell them that we have a robust immigration law and that they should use the right channels to come to Canada instead of crossing in between the borders. This isn't a new strategy. Early in the 20th century, the Canadian government also sent officials to the United States to discourage black migrants from coming to Canada. Quote, immigration officials sent two agents to Oklahoma whose job was to dissuade black Americans from immigrating. Both agents, one of whom was a doctor, went from town to town and employed many of the same tactics they told, uh, many of the same tactics. They told black Americans that crossing the border would be difficult and even debasing experience. That once in Canada, they would encounter the same racial prejudice as in America. That Canadian lands were difficult to maintain and that the cold Canadian climate would adversely affect their health." End of quote. In 2017, it was black officials like Hussein and Dubourg who put a friendly black face on an old message. Canada thinks it would be better for vulnerable black people not to come, or at least not to come and expect to stay. Thank you. Uh, thank you to also all of those who are across the street watching in the live stream. Uh, it is so wonderful that so many of you came out. I just want to say again how much that means to me. Thank you. I feel like you should have read more or could have. There's, there's a lot in that book. Um, OK, I'm going to. Hi. <laughs> Good evening. Bonjour, Maggie. <laughs> <laughs> um, this, man, this chapter is one of, there's one chapter for every month of the year of things that happened in 2017. Why did you choose to uh, read that chapter to us tonight? I thought that speaking about Haitian immigration makes sense because of where we are tonight. Um, you know, one of my first interactions with you was when we went to uh, uh, Marianne Nord 
and um, you know, I didn't know much about the Haitian community in uh, Mariano until I met you, and it was like, you know, going and participating in um, the festival there, seeing this community, um, hearing the summit that was happening at that time where people were talking about some of these issues was a really educational experience for me. And I just felt like I would imagine that there would be Haitian people in the room this evening. I wanted to share something of this book that people in this community have inspired. And to say that like this book was a great privilege for me to say, I see those struggles. As a journalist, I have an opportunity to speak about those struggles. And I want our country to talk more about why it is so counter to the narrative of Canadian inclusion and Canadian diversity that Haitian people are not welcomed here in the way that we say immigrants are welcomed here. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, you just said something really interesting, how you want us to s know or as a journalist or as an activist, you see the, the struggles and you want that reflected in your work. Absolutely. I think uh, for those of you who are about to read the book, you're going to see how that unfolds chapter, uh, chapter after chapter. Is there another part of the book that you think really um, uh, resonates particularly with people here or something something that um, happened that you feel is uh, some, that was inspired by this community for you? There, there are other um, moments definitely within the book. Another major one is um, the killing of Pierre Coriolan. Um, may he rest in peace forever and love and respect to his family. Um, I didn't want to read from that particular portion of the book because um, the stories that are the hardest in this book are for people to sit with. It's I, I put this down for all of you, and I want you to be able to do that, and it's very difficult to share these things in a group setting, and I didn't want to... Um, put that on to people this evening, but it is here because it does matter. What happened to Pierre matters to me for its own sake and also because it brings up for us other names and other experiences and other stories. The story of Andrew Loku in Toronto, you know, um, Andrew being inside his apartment and having people around him who really cared about him, who knew him. This is the thing, is that, you know, you see these uh, documentations in the media, and so often these black men who are taken from us by the police, who have mental health issues, the photographs that are used, these men are always alone. It's like they never had anybody, but it's not true. People in Pierre's building knew him. People in Pierre's building talked to him, were friendly with him, looked out for him. And then that evening, the police came and took everything away. In the same way, people knew who Andrew Loku was. In fact, Andrew's neighbor came and de-escalated the situation between him and his neighbors before the police ever came. The police were not needed that evening. And when people ask about um, police abolition as, it is, as if it is some far off fantasy, for me, police abolition just means that that interaction ends with, with, with Andrew Loku's neighbor de-escalating the situation and them going back to their homes. There was no need for the police intervention at all. And I would say the same thing about Pierre. I would say the same thing about Mashwar Madut 
in Winnipeg who was killed by the Winnipeg police in his apartment building, another black man who's then presented to the media as though he's just this isolated figure but had a whole South Sudanese community in Winnipeg around him who was making appointments to go seek uh, mental health support the day before he was killed. So um, I share that too here tonight because um, that's a collective pain that we feel when these things go down. When we hear stories, when I hear them from Toronto, but they're here or they're in Winnipeg or they're in Ottawa, in the case of uh, Abdurrahman Abdi, who I was in Ottawa last evening, um, it's a shared understanding. It's something that we don't even really have to say, but that we know intimately. And um, as I talk about in the book, it's a diasporic response when these men are taken from us in our communities, that people who didn't know them are the ones rising up, that people from their own local native communities are the ones rising up, but it's a broader thing. So I'm Sierra Leonean, but I'm seeing these men like I'm seeing their families and I'm like, this is my family as well, right? In, in Ottawa, it was definitely the Somali community that rallied for Abdurrahman, but it was a broader community of African people who were like, this is important, of Caribbean people who were like, we have to do and say things in order to fight back for justice. So uh, I came here and was with you and we marched. I will never forget the day that we marched for Pierre Coriola in the city. I was terrified. It was chaotic. It was um, spontaneous in many ways. We took over the jazz fest. We scene. took over <laughs> the jazz festival. And, um, before, even before the slap thing. <laughs> 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 we, knew, we knew it was coming. And I, and I want to say something else <laughs> about the media. We were very prescient. You're right. Um, when I watched the media that evening, we were on the national, that demonstration that we took over the jazz festival stage. And the lead in the national story was something about how um, they weren't there for the jazz. Like, they weren't there for the music or some <laughs> crap like that, right? But interestingly, if you remember this, I mean, the first thing that happened was activists took the stage and they led people in a chant saying, jazz is black. Jazz is black. That was literally the first thing that happened. And then uh, Jay Khan of Black Lives Matter Toronto was saying, like, it's all good for all you white people to be out here celebrating our music, but you don't care too much about our lives, do you? And Pierre proceeded to talk about what happened to Pierre Coriolan. That was extremely powerful for me. I'll never forget that. I, I want to read something from that you wrote yourself. You're going to remember, I think. <laughs> uh, that speaks to that, speaks to um, a frustrations, uh, which is a mild word to use about policing. Uh, the chapter... Uh, the September chapter, uh, titled Uncontrolled Movement, starts with, some of us have decided that policing, as it exists today, will never contribute to our safety or freedom. Others can imagine a world where police don't exist and are terrified at the suggestion. For the second group, which I believe includes the majority of white Canadians, racist police violence is the cost of being free. Violence is regrettable, and no one wants it, but not all violence is equally threatening, and many prefer police violence to the chaos they fear might follow for being too soft on black people. I'd like, us to, I'd like you to speak a little bit about that, because I feel like there's a um, failure of imagination at play in a lot of the debates um, you've been in when uh, people see things in a, I, won't, I don't want to say black or white, <laughs> but in a very, in a very either or. Um, and when, when, when you are describing uh, everything that you've just described or things you describe in the book about policing, uh, often the wall is, yeah, but what else could be, you know, what, what, what else could be done, you know? 
we, we see that all the time. Another story I describe in this book is about a six-year-old black girl who was handcuffed inside of her school in Mississauga. A journalist got upset with me today because I used the term shackled. She was shackled in her classroom in Mississauga, and he thought that that was me. I think white people think I'm trying to score points in a goal when I say these things. Uh, when in fact, if he had read properly, the first thing that the police did when they came into this room of this six-year-old girl, who were called by the school into the, poli into the room by the, by, by, the, by the school administration, they put the handcuffs around her tiny little wrists or ankles first, and then put the cuffs around her wrists. And I've never seen, I've seen a lot of things in the city of Toronto. I've never seen anybody do that, let alone to a child. The entire day after that story broke, the conversation from all these white male pundits was, well, what are you supposed to do? It was a rhetorical question, though, because they're asking the question as if it cannot be answered, as if, because they're too cowardly to say nothing else could have been done. So they ask as if maybe there is an answer, but we will never know. And um, again, in the, as in the case with Andrew, the answer is for the police not to arrive at all. It's for them to not be there. And if we need alternative thinking around this, I think what we have to do, rather than think of um, the superheroes with the badge and the Glock, who are coming to save us all when we're in trouble, I think we actually just need to think about what we as civilians do when people around us are in trouble, when people around us are in crisis. Um, my mom is a nurse. She's been working at a nursing home in Oshawa, Ontario for almost 30 years. There are very few nurses who can work that long and not be assaulted by somebody. The difference is that my mom doesn't have the legal authority to hit back, to punch back, um, to bite back. And um, if my mom ever used force against one of the people that she's supposed to care for, she would lose her license before she got out of the door. So she has to, first of all, take the hit. Literally, when somebody does something to her that they're not supposed to do, she has to and then say, how am I going to protect myself? How am I going to protect this other person? How am I going to protect the people around us? Her response can never be violence. And we know that as a black woman, even her tone can be perceived as being violent when she's the one being assaulted, right? So what does she do in that situation? That's the question to ask. My father was a mental health nurse. He's retired, but the same people whose lives are so cheaply taken, the same people who police describe as being such a threat that there was no other option, were people that my father dealt with worked with, spoke with, met with their families every day. And again, he had no option to use force of any kind against those individuals. Um, Sandy Hudson told a, a, a quite remarkable story um, from Toronto about a man who she and some other people witnessed one day. They were outside after an event, and they were in Young Dundas Square, and... Um, they witnessed this black man running through the square, and he was screaming. These are exactly the kinds of situations where people think, ah, police. Everything that follows is, um, is unhelpful, if not like actually deadly for us. The police happened to be around the square and saw this black man running through the square screaming, and one of them ran and caught up with him and tackled him to the ground. Sandy and others who had just been at this event ran over and started saying, what are you doing? Get off of him. Why are you doing this? They were able to get that police officer away because I suppose he was afraid of being witnessed by these folks. And it turned out that this man had just, when he was able to speak finally, 
he told them that he had just learned of the passing of his mother. The most natural reaction that one could have to that experience, interpreted by police as a threat to themselves or to somebody else around. It's not rocket science. It's not complicated. Sandy and them, had they seen this man and been the only ones there, would have done what they did anyway. They would have learned about what was going on for this man anyway. They would have done what they did anyway. What do you need? Can we take you somewhere? Can we drive you somewhere? Do you want some water? Do you want to sit, sit down somewhere away from these streets? We all know how to do this. So I think we need to uncomplicate these conversations and not allow for the, because um, um, the white um, lack of imagination on these things is disingenuous at its core. I don't believe people when they say, we don't know what to do. Because that means that you would handcuff your child when they were misbehaving inside. You do know. And if you don't know, then pass the mic on to somebody who does. You, you, just, you just mentioned how impossible or threatening it is to have emotional reactions to things that are happening in our lives. Uh, but especially to the police or to the injustice that's going on around us. Um, do you allow yourself to have the emotional reactions that are inside of you when you're doing this work? Or do you feel like you also need to? Because in the book, you know, there is a lot of facts and things about this is what happened to this and this and that person. But I think internally, um, it's hard. It's hard, and when you are um, expressing those things, then a lot of people will do to you what they are doing to the people you're defending, right? So how, how do you manage that? I think a lot of people need to learn how to do that, if it's possible. <laughs> This is a great question. Um, sometimes it's not possible. So I write about the struggle of DeFonte Miller in this book a 19-year-old who was attacked more than three years ago while walking on a residential street in Whitby. He was attacked by an off-duty police officer and his brother. Um, it has taken more than three years, but a trial has now taken place, which in and of itself is a small miracle because almost no officer in the province of Ontario even faces criminal charges for these kinds of behaviors. Neither here. Right. And I went to the trial. I was telling you that that was the two of the hardest weeks of my life this past November. And I did that immediately upon finishing this work of writing. But I wanted to be there for his family and for him. When I was sitting in the courtroom and these people are telling their lies, I couldn't contain myself. I was snorting. I was laughing derisively. I was crying. And I know that people are watching me. I know that my colleagues in the journalism profession are watching me. But I, can't, I literally can't. And I'm thinking, like, you're going to get thrown out of this courtroom. But I, I, I couldn't contain my rage at the lies that I was hearing. I couldn't contain my rage at DeFonte, the victim of this assault, being cross-examined by a defense attorney for eight hours, like he's the one who knocked out his own eye. I couldn't handle it. So in that moment, people saw the me that doesn't contain himself. Um, it's not always, it's not always, it's not always, um, It's not always so dire, I suppose, like um, when we were fighting for Abdul Abdi, a young man who was facing deportation from this country after coming here as a refugee, he and his family invited by the federal government to live here after being met by federal officials in a refugee camp in Djibouti. Subsequently, Abdul and his aunt and sister come to Canada, settle in New uh, Nova Scotia, 
after a couple of months of being here, child welfare agents arrive at his aunt's home and proceed to take away Abdul and Fatuma from the aunt. Abdul's mother did not come to Canada because it took three years from the Djiboutian refugee camp to process their claim, and she passed away during that time. So the aunt took custody of Abdul and Fatuma, and she became mom and brought them here. And so now these officials are coming. She's not really even fluent in English by this time, and they don't send a translator, but they take these children. To this day, Asha Ali is like, I don't know why they took these kids. I didn't hurt these kids. I didn't abuse these kids. I don't know why they took them from me. I fought so hard to get them back, and I was denied. Abdul and Fatuma were taken into child welfare and ultimately separated from one another. Six and eight years old, I believe, at the time, or seven and nine. Before they were separated, when they were still in the same place, they were told that they were not allowed to speak Somali to each other. And that, for me, conjures up the 60s scoop, the residential school system. When we say that these systems are designed to take away people's culture, people's language, it's real. It's very real. Abdul went on to get involved with the um, criminal justice system as half of young people in the child welfare system in this country do. He pleads guilty to a crime, and the government says, you know, you're up for deportation now. Abdul's been in Canada 18 years at this point. So um, we fight to try and stop that deportation. We did stop that deportation, and in a public place outside of that hearing room, I wept like a baby because I was so happy and again, you've got media colleagues who are like standing there, like typing texts to their like editor to try and get the story in. And I'm like in the hallway, like, I can't believe we won. <laughs> you know, because it was so meaningful of a moment for me. And sometimes you cannot contain it. I don't think you have to contain it all of the time, but sometimes it's just not safe. And me being ab not able to contain it in that courtroom was dangerous. Um, me seeing a young man on the street, as was documented in that documentary, and like almost cussing these police officers, getting right in their space, being like, don't you dare put your hands on him. It's not safe. But sometimes the rage, it bubbles over. It's also because you care. Of course, right. of course. But it's not of course, though, because there's a lot of people who don't care as much. And it's not just because you're black. There's a lot of people who care, but they don't care up to the point of, you know, uh, jeopardizing their careers and, you know, only breathing, eating, living the struggle. Um, why why do, you can't, do you think you personally care so much? I, I actually think it's a physical thing, to be yeah. completely, yeah. People say fight, flight, or freeze. Right. So you fight. I'm a fighter. Right. Yeah. Because for me, uh, it's like you're getting backed into the corner, and you don't want to feel your back hit the wall. So I'm going to fight before that happens. Because for me, that's the safety thing. I saw two transit cops in the transit station in Bathurst Station the other day. Our system in Toronto is unaffordable, slow, and, you know, everything else, but they can afford now to militarize the transit system because it's not the underfunding that's ruining the system. It's the poor person who wants to ride It doesn't have $3. That's what they're trying to do now. And I saw these two men, no neck, right? 100 pounds outweighing me, each of them. It, it's like... I was saying on the radio show the other day, it's like, it's like an employment program for big men with small egos, you know? <laughs> like, f failed cops and, like, failed cops and Drake bodyguards are these guys now, like, in the transit station, just like. And my instinct when I saw them was to go right up to them and be like, I keep hearing these announcements that you guys can not only lay a fine, but you can lay a criminal charge 
for what you call fare evasion. What is this criminal charge? And the one man said to me, fraud. So they now plan to charge people with defrauding the TTC. And I'm like, why don't you go out to the guy who parked the Lexus for 30 seconds in the parking space and wait till he comes back and handcuff him and charge him for fraud? Because you know what? He has the $425 for the fine, right? But for me, I think I have that reaction because again, if I feel like I have to walk into the transit system and keep my head down from that guy, that doesn't feel safe to me. So I told them before leaving, like, don't ever let any of us catch you putting your hands on a black person for what you call fraud. Because I have a camera and I have a platform and we're gonna make you famous if you ever put your hands on us. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's an instinct. But it isn't the safest approach in the world all the time, especially when you're like a buck 40 soaking wet. What was the hardest thing for you in writing this book? Sorry, my questions are like very easy. <laughs> <laughs> the March chapter that centered around the Justice for Abdurrahman campaign and the loss of our friend was the hardest thing I've ever written. The research that I had to do into his story, the reviewing of 911 calls, these were places that I just didn't want to go, ever. But in order to tell the story faithfully, I did do that. And I consulted with his family. And it was really difficult. It was so hard that I, I think I pushed down how hard it was to get through it. I wrote the book in order. So that's the March chapter, it's the third chapter of the book. And I wrote one more chapter after that, which was about my own personal struggles with journalism. It was a chapter I was actually really looking forward to writing and thinking, okay, you're gonna keep going. And as soon as I finished chapter four, I just had this feeling like I can't do this anymore. It's too hard. I'm not gonna finish this book. It's too much for me. And that's where the May chapter came from. That's where the chapter called Deep Breath, where I talk about flowers and birds and walking through the botanical gardens and eating with my friends and my mother. That's where that all came from because I thought like, I'm not gonna survive, but I need to pause and like share something different to give myself an opportunity to continue doing this. Um, this is That's true of writing, but that's true of everything. Mm -hmm. And this is actually not something I ever thought I would share with like public audiences uh, after the book was written, but I'm gonna share this as well. One of the other really hard things for me was, um, so I have an editor, her name's Martha Kenya Forstner, and she's been spectacular to work with in this process. Um, but we also had a copy editing service to fact check and to make sure that the words all make sense in English and everything. And I had an experience where I really felt like the guy who copy edited the book stepped over the line because he's white and there were things in this book that clearly got to him as a white man that he wanted to have a say about. The only problem was that he's not being paid to have a say. He was being paid to be a copy editor. And I have to tell you, and I, d I actually don't even think Martha appreciated when I was first trying to explain to her about this, how hurt I was that you would trespass me like that. My friend uses the word trespass, and I'm like, that was a trespass what you did to think that you had the right to tell a black person, no, I don't remember it that way. That's not how I heard it. That made me, so, I, just talking about it now makes me upset again, you know? That was hard. Um, but let me follow that by saying that the best part of this, because I wrote it sequentially, was writing the last chapter, 
writing about how everybody fought and rallied for Abdul and having this like repeat feeling of euphoria from that time. Because in the same way that we relive trauma sometimes, we can relive joy. And I wanted, I hoped, like I said to Martha, when this chapter gets read by people, I hope that while they're getting to the end of it, that they're feeling that like euphoria, that like high that I was feeling when we were experiencing this. Because I want people to go through a range of emotions with this. Yeah, because it's not just about the struggle. There's also a lot of wins um, that you document. Uh, things that were won by uh, BLM Toronto, uh, things that happened within Pride uh, Toronto, things that happened uh, with the removal of police officers as well uh, from Toronto school boards, <laughs> which is interesting because a lot of us here think like Toronto is so much better. <laughs> there's very much, no, but there's very much a perception um, and it's when you get to read that kind of book, you're like, it, you're, you're just switching the, the pain around. You just, it's just an exotic racism. <laughs> um, which brings me to the main coverage that the, your book is, is getting. You often, often when people are talking about the book, what leads is Desmond is writing about the fact that racism exists in Canada. And that is in and of itself, like the news, like your, your book is like, Canada, ca Canada has racism, and that's breaking news. And yeah. that's, <laughs> and that's the main takeaway that like, a lot of people take. It's like, oh wow, can you? Canada has racism, and I want to, I want to quote you because uh, th there's a lot of uh, shade in some of your sentences, <laughs> which are, which is very funny. Uh, but, but I think uh, it's also very therapeutic to have that shade out there. Um, but you say, in my experience, the average white Canadian doesn't know that British and French settlers uh, enslaved black and indigenous peoples on these lands for two centuries and simply shifted legislative tactics once they have abolished, quote, legal, unquote, slavery. Those who do not acknowledge slavery in Canada often add that it was, those who do acknowledge slavery in Canada often add that it was, quote, not as bad as in the States, unquote. A nod to the white Canadian proverb used as a checkmate and to a conversation. No need to consider anti-blackness here. The idea that Canada's racial injustices are not as bad as they could be, this notion of slavery light or, or racism light is what my friend calls the toy version of racism um, is a very Canadian way of saying, remember what we could do to you if we wanted to. Passive aggressive racism is central to Canada's national mythology and identity. White supremacy warns black people against setting our own standards and pursuing dreams that stray too far from the global atmosphere of anti-blackness. When you say passive aggressive racism is central to Canada's national mythology and identity, why do you think that is? So the first thing I want to say is that um, if I could release the version of this before Martha started her hard edit, I could put a like, label on it, like now with 40% more shade. <laughs> because I was just going off. And Martha was like, OK, we're going to pull this back. you know. <laughs> and in hindsight, I <laughs> appreciate her doing that. But um, that does happen when I write. I experience that, those set of emotions. And yeah, I can be a little bit snarky. You should have read that passage like before it got edited. It was worse. Or better. Or better. <laughs> Depending. But, um, but it's interesting because you write that, and that's kind of like the headlines as well for about the book. It's like, oh, Canada's racist. Well, remember how <laughs> I was saying that, like this kind of, this question of like, what do you do when a six-year-old is misbehaving? The the insincerity of that question is the same insincerity that is like racism, but does it exist here? Like it's so disingenuous, right? But framed as a question, as if to say like we're curious when you're really not curious. Um, why do I think 
that that's so central to Canada's identity, yeah, that notion how, of... How, how did Canada get that way? By uh, uh, living next to the elephant and being like, this motherfucker is loud. <laughs> like, no one is going to pay attention to anything I say or do as long as I point over there. That's why. Because it works. Because it's... Um, a lot of white identity is constructed through negation. It's like I say in the book, right? I know you are, but what am I? That's white supremacy, right? Don't look over here. There's something far more awful and sinister and interesting right over there, just behind your shoulder. Don't look here. It's a distraction. It's uh, an evasive uh, maneuver. And it's extremely effective in Canada. I mean, there are people blocking pipelines and solidarity with the people who are fighting for unceded Wet'suwet'en territory tonight in this country. Um, but like, the, 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 the Guardian news story revealing what we all should know anyway, which is the RCMP had directives to shoot to kill if they thought that that was necessary. Is that the polite Mountie that I saw in that part of our heritage commercial? Because it doesn't seem like it. But as long as we're talking about somebody else, it doesn't matter how polite the Mountie is. That's the whole point. It's to always, in hockey, you say rag the puck, right? You're winning and you want to kill time, so you just take the puck into the corner, you dawdle around with it so that the time runs out. You rag the puck, that's what we do. We don't want to talk about it, so we just stall and stall and stall until the time is out. And yeah, that passive aggressive stuff that we see, it manifests itself sometimes in things like Justin Trudeau telling demonstrators at his, um, at his gala as they're being removed, thanks for buying a ticket for the Liberal Party of Canada. He wasn't supposed to say that, right? He could have won that little encounter without the parting shot, but he can't help himself. The passive aggressiveness, the, the, the like that just seething right beneath the surface, like gritting of the teeth, sometimes it jumps out. And we do our best in this country to try and hide that because Contrasting ourselves with the big bad Americans is really effective. But the way that I want us to talk about that is since the advent of the 45th president of the United States, whose name does not appear in this book, um, what has Justin Trudeau done other than facilitate all of the surveillance through the Muslim ban and through uh, all of these new surveillance tactics that the United States and Canada are collaborating on to entrap black and Arab and Muslim people. He has completely just been, what do you need, boss? When it comes to um, the Safe Third Country Agreement that is stopping people from crossing regularly and making them sneak through the woods in the middle of the night. This is a partnership. It's a pact, literally, right? And when people say renegotiate that agreement, Trudeau's eyes just glaze over. It's not even that he's just sitting here passively. Our government facilitates the worst impulses of that administration and that president, and then comes here and says, do you want Andrew Scheer to be president? Prime Minister, right? Like, like I, I made a joke on Twitter that was like, uh, I went to my barber, and I was like, I want to try something new. And he's like, so you want Cheer to win? Like, <laughs> you, like. But as long as we're talking about negation, right? As long as we're shifting the focus to some boogeyman who's worse than us, we never have to talk about our legacy of colonialism. We never have to talk about the theft of the land. We never have to talk about the past loss system to control Métis people that then South Africa used in their apartheid state. Canada's actually exporting this stuff sometimes, not even, and that's the other funny thing is that we're pretending that like, oh, 
uh, um, Trumpism will creep up to Canada. It's, it's a distraction. Um, you talk about what's going on in Canada, what's going on not so much in the US, but how it was an inspiration to you at some point in your life. Um, but you talk as well about the fear that you just named of the alternative, the alternative being worse and how that keeps people from dreaming more and from working. And you just said that as something that, that is a, a trait of white Canadians, but in some ways that fear also works to hold back even the black community as well sometimes. And it can create a lot of division. Um, in, I guess as an ending parting question, because you guys are not gonna survive sitting like that forever. Um, <laughs> What would be something that you wish um, for our communities for this time, that years that's starting? What is something that you wish uh, to give or to gift uh, the black community with this book or the black communities? And what is something that you'd like to gift to the general Canadian public as well, white or just non-black as well with this, with this book? Well, let, let me start with black people because... Always. <laughs> because I'm going to start with black people. Right? Um, I talk in this book about um, people in our communities who hold certain positions of relative authority and relative power, not like absolute power, relative power, who may be in government institutions or other institutions, institutions that have the ability to cause great harm to black people, but who, if they were reformed or overhauled or abolished, could actually help uh, bring about our liberation. And I think one of the misinterpretations of some of my work is that people think that I'm telling those people that you're not doing the real work because you're in an institution. And I think what I would like to say is that the reason I present the, um, the conflict that often arises there is because black people need to be able to challenge one another and to disagree with one another and to have politics, to have class analysis as well as racial analysis, right? To have analysis around gender, and analysis around sexuality, like black people have to be allowed to be complicated. Not all black people speak English or French, right? Like not, we're, we're, we're complicated people and we have to be allowed to be that. And um, I talked about that in this book to say to black people, like let us allow ourselves to be complicated. If we don't agree, let us find ways to say that and to enact uh, our own politics as we see fit. And I do think that that can be interpreted as a gift because we are um, necess like we are understandably afraid of presenting anything but a unified voice because the master is watching. So I get it. I'm not trying to judge other people, but if you're in the institution, what can you do in the institution that is still pointing towards a goal of liberation. So for example, um, this is a weird ass example, but I'm gonna give it, because it has to do with like a very conservative black politician. Michael Thompson is a city councilor in Toronto, who's been a city councilor for a couple decades now. When I was first in Toronto, and there were a lot of gun uh, shootings the year that I first, uh, first full summer that I was there, Michael Thompson advocated as a black city councilor, as the only black person on city council in Toronto, that the police be given broader latitude to search black men to try and find weapons on them. Now, the joke was on Michael Thompson, of course, because the police were already doing that. But he thought that this would be a good thing to do, and quite frankly, white politicians put him up to it, and he agreed. There are people 15 years on who still associate the name Michael Thompson with that statement that he made and will never, ever forgive him. And I get that. But Michael Thompson did something actually quite radical 
um, uh, just a few years back. He used to be on the police board in Toronto. So he's in the belly. He's not just a city councillor. Now he's on the police board that gets a billion dollars to try and control black life. He got frustrated because the racial profiling issue, something happened to him. Like I don't know if something happened to him personally or to his family, but he started getting really angry about this. And then he started talking about it. And then he was removed from the police board. And then Michael Thompson did something that I wish all black people and institutions would do. He waited for the next city budget and he tabled this motion. It was a five part motion. Part one of the motion was defund the police budget in Toronto by $25 million. And I have a list, children's programs, breakfast programs, recreation programs. Here's where we're going to put this money and take it away from the police. A black man standing in front of all these white people saying this. Now he knew it was gonna fail. And that's why it was a five part motion. Because part one was take away 25 million. Part two was, oh, you don't like 25, it's too much? Okay, 20 million. Part three, if that fails, if motion B fails, 15 million, all the way down to 5 million, just to A, prove a point that there was no amount of money that his white colleagues were willing to remove from the police, but B, more importantly, to shame them by making vote them vote five times against black freedom and liberation. It didn't succeed, but it was a blueprint for actually asking for what we want instead of trying to play these strategic games. And I wish that black people in public office would at least express our will and make them publicly say no to us. Instead of trying to go into the back room and telling us that all the things that we can't see them doing are actually helping somehow. So that's the gift for black people is let's challenge one another. And um, for everybody else, I would say my gift for this book is I did a lot of historical research. I did way more reading than I wrote. And um, I tried to, I learned a lot writing. And I tried to show an image of this country that I don't see our mainstream media up to the task of, of exposing. And if you are a journalist, if you are a storyteller, if you fashion yourself a truth teller in any way, use these stories as a starting point. Use the references in this book. Read Agnes Calise, who wrote brilliantly about black immigration to this country. Like, read her. Read L. Jones, probably the greatest columnist in this country, who never gets any recognition and who I'm gonna be with in Halifax tomorrow. Use these resources so that when people try to confront you, you can say, you know what, in that really like awesome, polite way, like, if you're really interested, why don't you read this? And then afterwards, we can have a conversation. <laughs> you know, I, there are some great resources in here for you to help educate yourself and help educate other non-black Canadians who might be lacking in the curiosity that's necessary to have these conversations. So I'll leave it there. Thank you, Desmond. I, I would like to ask everybody before we go to a book signing, I know we're gonna take a quick break and people probably wanna step outside and get some fresh air, so I'll speak quickly. I would like to ask you all to do something because I've been asking folks to do this everywhere that I go with this book. Um, we have opportunities when we gather in these spaces to do little acts of resistance and of supporting other black people. Um, I haven't actually done this myself, like in terms of the search that I'm about to ask you to do, but everybody pull out your phone if you have access to it. I'll give you a second. Folks who are on the live stream, I believe that I'm coming over to where you are in the other book building to um, sign books. So you uh, take out your phones out there on the live stream as well, please, and um, um, follow along. If you search for the following in a Google search, 
I hate promoting them, but I mean, the results pop up. So it's change.org, C-H-A-N-G-E dot O-R-G. And then the next word I want you to put in is a name. It's Santina, S-A-N-T. -T. No, just change. It's not an address. It's just a search. And it's just so change.org and then give a space. And then S like Sam, A-N like Nancy, T I. N, like Nancy A, Santina. And it's my second result when I do that search. You see a petition. It says, Petition Justice for Santina Rayo, change.org. I'm going to be with this wonderful black woman and her family tomorrow in, Val in Halifax for a book event. And I will briefly read it to you. On January 15th of 2020, multiple police officers inside a Halifax, Nova Scotia Walmart assaulted Santina Rayo in front of her two children after accusing her of stealing groceries. When police and Walmart staff confronted Santina and she offered that they search her belongings, police shifted tactics and asked for Rayo's identification. Multiple officers ultimately attacked Santina, broke her wrist, and left her with a concussion and bruises all over her body. The police then laid three criminal charges on Santina saying she assaulted the police, resisted arrest, and created a disturbance in the Walmart. We are beyond tired of the attacks on black people across Canada, especially by the police who have never served and protected black people. We are fed up with police forces that apologize for racial profiling but never stop doing it. We have no more patience for politicians who cover for the police and ask us to wait for the next bogus investigation before we judge them. We therefore demand that, number one, the Crown's office in Nova Scotia immediately drop all criminal charges against Santina Rayo. Number two, the Crown's office investigate and charge all officers involved in the assault on the Santina Rayo. And number three, Walmart Canada immediately lift its nationwide ban of Santina Rayo, which they did right after they arrested her, and compensate her for the violent intervention initiated by its employees. There are some links underneath if you want to read more about this, starting with a Halifax Examiner story by L. Jones, who started this petition. This petition was started a week ago, right before I launched in Toronto. It already has almost 5,000 signatures. I want to get it over 5,000 before this night is over, and I believe that all of you can help me right now by signing this petition and using your networks, whether that be uh, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, email lists, whatever you use to communicate to people, word of mouth, please help us seek justice for Santina. Her court date is next week, and we want as many Canadians by that time to have signed this, demanding that those charges against this woman be dropped. So thank you in advance and justice for Santina Rayo. Also, thank you to Drawn and Quarterly. Thank you to my publicist, uh, Scott Sellers. Thank you to um, every single person here for coming out. Uh, please support your independent bookstores. Thanks, everyone. Yeah, well, we're going to get started, as we say, at the other, at the other store first. Uh, so if you want to let us out and then uh, stick around, we'll be back. Thanks. Yeah, I'm, I'm coming back to sign books. I'm just going to go to the other place first because they've been very patient. I'm coming back to sign books. So the, the, the line that we'll do as well uh, for what, once Desmond's here, if you want to form in a line, it'll go this way. And then the signing table's here. Thank you. <laughs>